It's estimated that tens of thousands of British men are raising children that they believe to be their own, but aren't. It's known as paternity fraud. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either, but it often involves a woman failing to admit that the child is the result of an affair. Now, around 4% of children are thought to be the result of paternity fraud. That's one child in every classroom, if you extrapolate it out. Now, this morning, we want to hear from you. Have you discovered that a child isn't yours? Uh, Two-thirds of paternity tests reveal the assumed father is indeed the biological father. But if you've taken a test, uh, we'd love to hear from you this morning. Perhaps you didn't quite get the result that you were expecting, or perhaps you've hidden the real identity of your child's father, the flip side of it all. 0500 909 693, if you want to get in touch with me this morning. Uh, the text number is 8505. Eight. Um, really like to hear your stories on this this morning. Let's speak to Professor Mark Bellis, who's uh, the director of the Centre for Public Health at Liverpool John Moores University, an expert in all of this, describes the issue of paternity fraud as a ticking time bomb. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Uh, good to have you with us this morning. And we can also speak to Edward. Edward doesn't want to use his surname. Um, he's had two daughters, one son with his ex-wife, but discovered that he wasn't the biological father of his youngest daughter. Good morning to you, Edward. Good morning, Chris. Thanks so much for agreeing to speak to us. Let's just um, try and get your story in full, if we can, and let's go back to the start. Just take us back to the point in your life when all of this was happening. As I say, you, you were married uh, and a child was born. What, what were your overall circumstances at that time in, in terms of your relationship and in terms of the rest of the family? Uh, the relationship with my wife and two children, plus the, the new one on the way, who was born approximately 29 years ago was quite good we were sort of happy we had our usual ups and downs the families do mm -hmm. and uh, but when my daughter was about four years old um, my wife and I separated we've been together for about um, 12 years separated and that was that and I carried on supporting my wife financially and seeing the children as regular as possible and my at that time my daughter was four and so we, you know, life carried on, and I found a new, a new wife. You know, we went through divorce and everything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, when my youngest daughter was 17, going through her teenage years, which I know is a tough time for a lot of parents. Fortunately, I didn't have to deal with most of it. She was wasn't living with me. She was living with her mum. They ended up in an argument, and the argument was things like whatever mums and daughters argue about. Yeah, sure. And uh, my wife said, oh, you're, you've got your father's temper and you've got his terrible eyes when you shout and scream and all that, which we haven't. And my daughter told me this story and said that um, I've since found out I don't think I'm your daughter, you're my dad. And I says, well, one of the problems we have in this world is it's difficult to get to the truth. And there was an opportunity about going through DNA. Well, let, let, let's let's get to that in a, in a second, because I want to hear your thoughts of, you know, how you approached that and how you felt directly afterwards. But just rewinding a little bit. Yes. Did you have any reason to believe at any stage that, that, that she wasn't your child until that point, until she started suggesting otherwise? Because, you know, everyone says my baby, I've got a six month old baby. Everyone says she's the absolute spit of me. There's no, there's no doubt. I mean, did you know presumably she wouldn't have looked like you so presumably there might have been a degree of suspicion earlier you no know, i never had to I'll give an example when she was born when she was born 29 years ago i remember picking her up the day old and i looked at her little baby little tiny thing which yeah. looks nothing like anybody apart from baby um and I, I i said to myself and i said to uh I think it was a friend. I said, I don't think this is my little girl. And he says, what makes you say that? I said, oh, I don't know. I'm being stupid. And yeah. that was, you know, it was, it was just a shock. I mean, she was a, a surprise, if you like. The other two were more planned and this one wasn't. There's a gap of about 10 years between the other two and her. So she's almost become like an only child because of the age difference. And that was the end of it. And I mentioned to my wife, oh, she's not mine. You know, she's a pain. She's crying a lot, can't be mine, except did, when they're asleep. Did you mention that more than once, or was it just that, that passing conversation? Because well, I would imagine, you're, you know, if you said it more than once, your wife might have started reacting in a particular way as well. No, no, she, I know, she just poo-pooed me, and I thought she yeah. was right. And I brought it up a few years later, just as a thought. But it, it was a passing thought, and it's me being stupid and, and mm, I don't, neglectful, I suppose you could say. But that was it, and I never thought anything of it again. And then even when we were going through divorce and all the finances were sorted out, never considered it at all, never thought about so it. So I'm still just trying to get clearer in my mind. Just explain to me a little bit more about, you know, when it began formulating in your mind that everything wasn't quite right. This was your, your, your daughter herself said to you 
Yes, I mm. mean, I mean, I went through that sort of phase, which is not mine, especially when they're all, they're crying a lot at night. Sure. Um, but that was it, the end of, and I had three children, I had a wife, we'd had some, her ups and downs, usual things. Um, but then what happened was, I used to see my daughter regularly at weekends, every weekend, especially on Sunday, um, and when she got to the teenage years, she wanted to see me less, it was her own life, of course. And then when she got to 17, there was this big bust up with her mother. Yes. Um, and then she came to see me and I was with my wife, my new wife of now 20 odd years, who was a counsellor at the time. So she knew about these sort of emotional things, which I'm not into. And we sat down and she, my daughter was crying a lot, telling me about this argument about mother accusing I wasn't the father, all these sorts of things coming out. And I sat there and I, they had the flashback of her birth and said mention this thing about dna because we know that my ex-wife used to lie a lot tell lots of stories but the trouble is there's always an element of doubt possible truth and so on and i sat with her and she didn't know what to do and i didn't know what to do and i said well at least we can get to the truth which i think is this thing called dna I didn't yes remember. but it, it seems it, it seems extraordinary that there was the sort of foresight and suspicion of a 17 year old girl uh, that led you to start thinking that not everything was right. I would have expected that to have come from you. No, not at all. I mean, maybe call me stupid. I don't know. I mean, I was, I'm a family man. I enjoy my family. It's like at the moment now I've got six children and I've got 12 grandchildren from the, my wife and all that. It's fantastic. Um, but this didn't cross my mind. I was working hard, paying off my wife the maintenance money, looking after the children. That's what I enjoyed. I never, never dreamt of that. I never thought, well, basically, I never thought no individual human being who once loved me, called my ex-wife, who had a daughter, would lie to something like that. It's a terrible lie to live with. How can you live with that? Of course. So in the end, in this kind of collaborative way, as you're describing, you went down the route of a DNA test. How did that work? Well, you know, I heard about this DNA. I mean, we've all read about it. It was all very exciting stuff. The, 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 the citing side of the, uh, of the science spoke to my daughter and we, we, we agreed that we wanted to do it to get to the truth you know either way just to get to know it was, the outcome was important the truth um, so I did some research on the internet and in the early days of, we're going back 12 years so it was perhaps early days I'm not sure um, and I found a few websites and there was something here called a DNA test where a kit was sent to your GP, you paid a lump of money. So I went ahead and did it. And I sat with my daughter, we talked about it, we agreed to it. So I paid the money and sure enough, a kit arrived at the GP practice a week or so later. Then I arranged an appointment with the GP, the doctor. Now, because it was just myself and my daughter, they had to take extra blood. I'm not sure about DNA. It wasn't both parents, but anyway, it was just my blood and her blood. Went to the doctor. Blood was taken in the GP practice. We signed documents proving whose blood it was and so on. And that kit was sent off. And that was the end of it. Um, and about two or three weeks later, a letter arrives one to my daughter, one to me, basically saying that the chances of her being your daughter was negligible in terms of percentages, uh, which proved that she was not my daughter. And how, you know, go back to that day, how did you feel when you opened that letter and, and, and read those details? Well, I know I was totally devastated, shocked, but whatever words they were, I was devastated that something like this had happened, that she was not my daughter. She had a similar letter and we talked on the phone and met up and I said I said to her and I still believe today she might not be biologically my daughter but I still love her and at the time of her being 17 she was still a bit of a pain but she's come through that teenage years and she's still my daughter but, but, but has it has it changed I mean you know it's difficult yeah. to know how it would have changed your relationship isn't it because you don't know what it would have been like otherwise but h how is your relationship with her compared to the relationship you have with your other children from that marriage well, OK, currently our, our relationship is a little bit strained, but it's only been the last year. But generally, it's been OK. So there's other factors, is it? Oh, there's other factors, yeah. definitely. Mm. Um, but no, um, it has changed. It has scarred me. It has scarred her. And what I thought about after all of this, when you come through all your own personal emotions, I was thinking of her as a 17-year-old suddenly discovering that I'm not her dad. It must have been worse for her more for them for me. I don't know. I'm assuming that, especially at 17, that that age group. And then her mother said to her, admitted that I was not the father, 
and that he was this father. This other chap was her father. So my ex knew who the father was. It wasn't one of these one-night stands and she wasn't sure. She appeared to be definitely sure that this other person was my daughter's father. And Edward, how did, how did you go about, you know, telling other people in your life, other friends and, you know, acquaintances? Um, did, you, did you feel embarrassed? Did you feel foolish that you had been duped for so long? I think, that, I think a good word is foolish, stupid, duped, those sorts of words. And everybody asks me, how do you feel about your daughter now? And I says, well, it actually hasn't changed, although there is a mark there. There is, a, there is a, obviously a subtle change. I suppose it's very much, I, the way I consider it is having an adopted child. Um, you still love them in the same way but it's obviously not your blood but they're still my she's still my daughter whether i like her or dislike her at the moment she is still my daughter i feel responsible and that's and the thing you, you you still went through all of those feelings that any father has that that you know the the, the bond that develops through the familiarity absolutely. those moments of magic you have when you hold them and they hug you and and all of that you still went through all of that edward stay with us it's, it's been fascinating and, and thank you for being so open and revealing with your story uh, stay with us because we're going to continue to talk about this and we're going to continue to talk about it with professor mark bellis as well uh, and expert in this area, director of the Centre for Public Health at Liverpool John Moores University, and uh, we're getting your texts and calls on this as well. And this morning, for the first hour of the show, we are talking about paternity fraud. Uh, this is where men are raising children they believe to be their own, but aren't. It's estimated there's tens of thousands of British men in that situation right now. 0500 909 693. We want to hear from you this morning. Have you discovered a child isn't yours? Uh, Perhaps you've hidden the real identity of your child's father. 85058. A couple of texts. Roger in Wolverhampton says, Hello, I just found out that two children I believe were mine are in fact not. Both boys have different fathers and I'm not one of them. It's always been a family joke that the boys do not like, not look like anybody in our families. Uh, a joke I'm sure that's not so um, funny now. Um, this is an ugly phone-in topic, says another text. If I was with someone I loved and they had a baby, I'd love them both no matter who the father was. This phone-in is about property rights not love anyway paternity fraud goes both ways too there must be lots of unmarried fathers with no paternal responsibilities go after them uh, just a couple of your views this morning professor mark bellis as i say the director of the center for public health at liverpool john moore's university um thanks for hanging on for us professor um these figures we're talking about an estimated tens of thousands around four percent of children thought to be the result of paternity fraud as we were saying that's one child in every classroom where do you get those kind of figures from well, there are very few studies, well, practically none, that have directly measured this, but there are a variety of genetic studies which have inadvertently, when they're looking at genetic diseases or heritability of different um, genetic patterns, have inadvertently uncovered levels of paternal uh, discrepancy or pater paternity problems. Uh, if you put all those together, um, you get a figure of around 4%. And to put that in perspective, there's about, in England and Wales, there's about 700,000 births a year. That's that would mean about 26,000 births would be attributed to the wrong father. OK, and in most cases, are we talking about, you know, there will be men, presumably, in those statistics who go their entire lives without ever finding out the truth, of course. Um, but then on, on, on the flip side, there must be fathers who have always been a little bit suspicious. I just wonder how, how the truth in those cases most of the time outs. Is it, is, it, is it because the father has always had some kind of suspicion? Or... Is it, 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 like we heard with Edward's case, that, that sometimes the children are, 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 are the ones that bring it to the fore? Well, uh, uh, this is changing very quickly. Um, we're seeing, over the last couple of decades, we've seen huge increases in the numbers of people who are going for paternity tests. And even recently now, with big high street names providing paternity tests, it's becoming more and more accessible. So in the past, what this used to really be was, was a suspicion that may have caused stress and problems in the family. It may not even have been talked about. The reality is now that people can, for £100, uh, go out and get a certainty, some certainty about which children actually are and aren't theirs. And unfor well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, this opportunity is being taken up more and more. Mm. Uh, can we assume by the time that happens, by the time it gets to a point where a paternity test is, is decided to be the way forward, um, the, the relationship in most of those cases is, is over? 
Um, not necessarily, no. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it could be that this, that the, the paternity test could be the end to a piece of stress, that there may have been just some discussion. It may just be the piece of proof someone needs. Obviously, in those relationships, something is wrong. Often, the paternity test is looked at as something bad. But, of course, in some circumstances, it, it, may, it may confirm the paternity of the father. Um, the problem at the moment is that the more we know about DNA, the more important it now is becoming not just for the father and mother, but for the child to know who their parents are as well. Yeah, and I suppose there's a, well, the undercurrent here is that the, the reason that perhaps the truth is being kept back from a father is what? I mean, in some cases, people are going to say it's due to financial concerns, presumably. Well, the co of course, there may be financial concerns. There may be worries about all sorts of things in the family. And the cost of raising a child, I think, is now uh, over a, a child up, up to about 21 is about £200,000 on average. So that's an enormous financial concern. Um, but but the information the, the mother may not know in some circumstances. Um, and in some circumstances, there may have been more than one partner at the same time. Mm. So there may be some uncertainty on both sides. Uh, so there's a whole variety of reasons why that information may not come out. Uh, the reality now is though that as i said as you, as you know more and more we've got to think of the child and that the balance is changing so that there's more importance in a child knowing its family's genetic history what what things it may be at risk of health wise later in life let's speak to anthony who's in buxton who's given us a call morning anthony good morning uh this happened to you you found out your son uh, wasn't yours when uh, well he was just getting towards his teenage years yeah he, um, he, he was he was 12 years old um when i found out um, it, uh, I, basically, I, I could feel that um, something wasn't right. My son wasn't growing to look more like me. He was, he was growing to look less like me. Um, and his, his mother's behaviour was wrong. Uh, so there, was, there were signs that were there. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I said to my, my wife one night, I said, you know, for all I know, you know, my son's not mine. And she said, well, look, you know, I've never said anything to you, but, you know, she, she's thought it. Um, so I, I went and did a DNA test, you know, got one for, off, the, off the internet. Mm. Um, I did the test and the results came back that no, there was absolutely no chance that, um, that he was, I was his biological father. Um, I mean, my, my son was, um, you know, the first, first grandchild, first great grandchild, first great great grandchild in my family. So, I mean, he was absolutely cherished. Mm. So I had to tell my mother. So I went round to my, you know, my mother's home and, you know, told her what happened and she told me that she already knew um she'd known for two weeks um she'd um, done a dna test herself um and the reason she'd done the dna test was because the, the guy that is his biological father um had found out that um he was his biological father some some friends of his had um seen him it, um what they thought was his son in the street and said oh you know i'd seen you i'd seen your boy he said, I don't have a son. They said, I'm telling you, that's your son. They'd seen him with the mother. They knew the relationship that those guys had, had over a 12-year period. He said, I'm telling you, there's no way that that's not your, that's not your child. So he knew where my, where my brother worked. He approached my brother and said, look, um, I am, you know, your brother's, um, your, your, your nephew's father. And he took one look at the guy and knew it was the truth. Mm. He, t he told my mother, um, and she performed a DNA test between my youngest son and um, and um, and my and my biological son, and um, it obviously came back. You know, there was no way. So she'd known for two weeks and didn't know how to tell me. So how, 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 how did your how did your, how did your mother go go about getting the DNA? I mean, because you know, for, for a twelve-year-old boy, that must have same, been quite same, same thing. I, I think she, I think it was a mouth swab. Yeah, um, I think it was a, I think it was a mouth swab. Um, but I mean, in, in, that, in basically one day, I found out that you know my, my son wasn't my biological son. And I found out who it was, and she got a photograph of the guy. And you, from one look at the photograph, I knew that it was the truth that this this was the man that was his biological father. And so, um, you know, just just kind of fast forwarding a bit, what's it meant for your relationship with um, the boy you thought was your son? Well, my relationship with my son is strong. Um, I mean, because basically, we went to court. Um, the court said, "No, you can't see your son because at the time his mother had kept him away from me for six months." Um, he'd only got one side of the story. Um, and so, you know, he thought, maybe, I don't know if he thought, you know, that maybe his dad would want him, but that's not the truth. That's not the case. I love my son, you know, and I, and I want my boy. I'm always going to be his dad. You know, that's all there is to it. Mm. Um, but, um, um, 
it, it, it's hard. I, I mean, I, I go and find him in the park, so and we talk, and you know, um, you know. So, but my son, I, I, I asked, asked him if he wanted to come away with me this summer on holiday, and yes, he did. Um, you know, and spoke to spoke to his mum. Yes, yeah, all right. She, she gave him the, the signals that yes, he could come, and when he came to it, and no, she, um, you know, she she stopped him at the last minute. Um, so I, I know, you know, in the next couple of years, once my son's old enough to defy his mother, that he will come. Um, but I mean, she, she's robbed him of, of these years of his family. Half of his family's just been snatched away from him, and there was no need for it. Anthony, thank you. Uh, appreciate you getting in touch this morning. Anthony in Buxton. Just going back to you, Professor Mark Bellis. I mean, obviously, the stories we're going to generally hear this morning are going to be stories from, from the parents and the impact uh, it's had on them psychologically and in terms of how their family works. But, of course, the impact on the child involved, how, how would you begin to sit down and explain that to a child once the truth is out? Well, I mean, I think this is this is one of the questions we need to answer. I mean, that caller showed just just how much of a family is affected. So this figure of 4%, if we take that as an example, that's just the number of children affected. But you've got the whole wider family around that. Um, sitting down and talking talking to the child, uh, people are discussing genetic counsellors and others about how that might be done. But we don't know enough because the studies haven't been done about the consequences and the best ways of handling these issues. Mm. The problem is, that, that we've, got, we've got a problem everybody's very uncomfortable with and, and that's stopping us understanding the best ways of dealing with it because we haven't got the sorts of information we might have on a whole range of other social conditions. OK, uh, we'll leave it there, but thanks very much indeed for your time. It's been, uh, it's been very revealing stuff. Professor Mark Bellis, who's the director of the Centre for Public Health at Liverpool, John Moores University. And I'm not sure if Edward's uh, still there, but uh, thank you, Edward, as well. We heard his story. Uh, he had two daughters and one son with his ex-wife had discovered he wasn't the biological father of his youngest daughter. A few more of your texts on 85058. Mark is in London. I only found out that my father isn't my biological father five years ago after applying for my passport it doesn't change a thing he says i was 27 then dave in worcester i found out when i was 15 that my dad was not my father and he was also not my brother's father added to that is that my brother has a different father to me i have since met my father uh so that's a, a complicated situation for them and fran that caller that said this is an ugly phone in is missing the point it's not about your partner having a child with someone else it's about them lying about it if the truth was told then an informed decision could be made by the other party. Keep your thoughts coming in on this 85058 0500 909 693 if you want to give us a call this morning. It's just coming up to 10.33. Estimated that tens of thousands of British men are raising children that they believe to be their own but who aren't. Uh, paternity fraud is, is, is the name given to this, often involving a woman failing to admit that the child is the result of an affair and the figures uh, that we have, the, not much research been done into this but the suggestion is around 4% of children are thought to be the result of this. One child in every classroom. Um, Dave in Worthing, uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, you discovered that your son uh, wasn't actually your son after all. That, that's true. Um, when he was about, he was just coming up to four, I guess, and uh, it was during the process of getting divorced I, I discovered that. How? Um, it, it, we were having words, really, and uh, my my ex said, "Well, we're threatening uh, not being mean, being able to see the children." And uh, it came out, you know, she said, "Well, you won't get to see them anyway; they're not yours." And this applied to to just one of them, actually. And I mean, you know, presumably at the at the start, you you were you were you taking it seriously what she was saying, or did you take it as as read that she was telling you the the, the honest truth? <laughs> You know what? It, it, it suddenly struck a chord. I, I thought, yes. I, 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 I sort of, I, very originally, when the pregnancy was announced, I, I, I sort of thought about it and I thought, oh, this doesn't make sense. And then I, I guess I didn't want to know that. And mm. I put it away for four years and then, then it came back to, to haunt me. Um, we never discussed it before then. I, I just uh, assumed that I'd got dates wrong and so on mm. and, uh, and then discovered it. Um, <laughs> But the, the, the story rolled on quite a bit from there. So at the time, I, I was quite surprised. It didn't make any difference to me whatsoever. As far as I was concerned, he was my son. I loved him, brought him up. And um, I think it was mutual because uh, he, he had no idea of me either. Um, we got divorced. And then for the next three years, I had regular access to him along with the other children. 
Um, but things changed when he was seven, when my ex um, got remarried. And I haven't seen him since, actually. That's, uh, apart from a couple of days, uh, in 10 years, I've not really seen him. But I'm required to pay for him by court orders, which I can't seem to change. And I can't get access to him because the court says I don't have any right to access. So some people might find that surprising that you're still having to pay for a son that isn't actually yours. The, the court order was uh, around his education originally. Uh, they were treating him as a, a child of the family. Uh-huh. And uh, I was ordered to pay for private education, which the other children were, were getting. Mm. Um, and it's had a big consequence because as I rolled on, I've also got remarried. And when I got remarried, I, I just couldn't really afford the private education thing anymore. And uh, had a long discussion with my ex saying, I can't do it anymore. Recommend you take him out. And... Uh, she didn't want to do it, but didn't object. And the situation, I didn't. I stopped paying then about um, seven years ago. And five years ago, she came back with a, a court order saying that I hadn't paid for two come going on three years, and the heavy fees were sort of twenty five thousand a year type fees. Yeah. And she forced the sale of the house that I was in with my new wife in the court. And no, we don't own a house. Um, and my son is still in private education, and I still don't see him. And, and, yeah. It just, and, and it's all been supported by by the law. They said, well, it's unfortunate. It doesn't seem fair, but strictly with, with the, the, the word of the law, um, you're in the wrong. I feel quite hard done by, actually. Am I, well, and I also, but, but also, the kind of, you know, away from the kind of financial aspect of it, which must be very, very difficult for you, but it just, it just park that to one side, just in terms of the, you know, the psychological impacts. It's one thing, you know, struggling to get as much time as you want to see your children from a, from a breakdown of a relationship, but when it actually is, you know, discovered that a child you thought was yours isn't, I mean, w- w- the actual emotional impact on you, Dave, h- how is that? I, I, yeah, it, it was... It was significant. Um, I was I was sad and disappointed, uh, but actually, in in the love sense, it didn't make any difference. Right. Um, you, I, I always liken it to uh, if I had adopted a child, uh, I wouldn't love love them any less. If you see what I mean. Um, than my other children. Yes, well, exactly. We, we, we discussed this earlier on with a couple of other callers we were speaking to, that kind of bond that, that develops yeah. father and child, etc. that, you know, that, that that can't die, can it, really? Uh, Dave, thank you no. for your call. Uh, let's go to another Dave uh, in Worcester. Uh, the other side of the coin here, really, Dave, isn't it? You, you discovered uh, that your father wasn't actually your father. That's right, yeah. Um, I found out when I was 15, when uh, my mum and dad split up, and... Uh, I was fleeing with my mum, and uh, in the uh, conversation, um, someone, the, the person that was with my mum said, oh, you know, is it, uh, is, it, is it the real father? And she let it slip, and she forgot that I was actually sat behind her. And that's how I found out, and then obviously it was explained to me properly then. It was explained to you properly as a 15-year-old, um, which, you know, 15-year-olds who go through divorce and, and things like that, that, you know, we, we hear so much about what kind of potential psychological impact there can be that, from that, but for something like this, do, do you remember how you felt as a 15-year-old boy being told something like that? Well, yes, I do, and it's a bit weird because uh, at the time, being a 15-year-old, you know, hormones, a bit rebellious, uh, I was actually chuffed that he wasn't my dad. However, very shortly after the the penny dropped and I realised that I loved him. And of course, it makes no difference whatsoever uh, if your if your dad that brings you up is your biological father or not. No difference at all. Do you, do you know who your biological father is? Uh, yes, and I met him for about 10 minutes when I was 15. It completely freaked me out because as soon as I, um, I'd spoken to him for a couple of minutes and then I went to sit down at a table with him in a, in a, a sort of a back room, a bar room, and uh, the, he introduced me as his son. It freaked me out and I never saw him again until about 18 months ago um, when I contacted him again. Um, but just to add to this, and this is, you know, really cookie noodle, uh, <laughs> I, was at, I, was, I was at school with somebody with the same surname as me in my class, uh, and uh, I'm dark-haired, he was ginger, and I didn't realise that this person was my cousin, blood cousin, and, uh, and he knew all along. He knew all parents, along? His parents had told him not to tell me. And uh, and that freaked me out. Did you get on well with him? Was he all right? Well, yes, I did. Yeah, but this, it goes. Even, this is even going to freak out even more because what what also happened was I have the same surname as my brother, who has a different father to me. But 
the person who is my father has the same surname as my dad who brought me up. Right. And so what's actually happened is my brother has my dad who brought me up, has his surname because my parents were together when my brother was born. I have the same surname because of my biological father. Well, you know, families, they can be a complicated business, can't they? <laughs> really deep, isn't it? Dave, consider, really deep. consider my noodle well and truly cooked. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your call. Keep your calls and thoughts coming in on this one. 0500 909 693. You can text the show as ever, of course, on 85058. This issue of paternity fraud.